The Council will now consider its response to the petition submitted by Councillor Dickerdom on the London Needs Homes petition, which is items 13 and 21, followed by the motion at item number 22 on fair funding for schools, and then by the motion at item number 23, uh, combating anti-Semitism. Dealing now with Londoners Need Homes, may I firstly ask Councillors Dickerdom and White to move and second the motion in their names. Uh, moved. And I second. <coughs> An amendment to the motion has also been circulated in the Chamber. Can I ask Councillor Salier and Sweet to move and second their amendment? I move the amendment. I second the amendment. <coughs> we have speakers. Councillor Dickerdom. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm glad this debate has taken place and that this council is not being allowed to forget what happened this summer when the ones of Tories put developers' interests before the interests of those in desperate need of homes. The petition that has led to this emergent de debate is a testament to this betrayal, with 21,557 Londoners making themselves heard. In the last two weeks, we have seen the issue of housing frame the national political conversation. Why? Because so many people were struggling with growing rents that wipe out their wages. So many are trapped in cramped, overcrowded conditions, all left to wait on housing waiting lists. In Wandsworth, we have 1,571 homeless households living in temporary accommodation alone, and yet we are building luxury flats. I have said it over and over again since becoming a councillor. We need to build council houses if we are to solve the housing crisis. It is reducing the demand at the lower end of the market that has always been the key. Currently, low-income households are forced into the private rented sector, requiring much higher levels of housing support and pulling this as existing supply chain. To understand why ones of Conservatives just don't get it, why they think turning our borough into a developer's free-for-all is going to solve the housing problems that face us, you have to understand this council's record. In 1987, the chairman of Wandsworth's Property Sales Committee stated, my aim is to reduce the number of council properties in Wandsworth from 35,000 to 20,000 and to make Battersea a Conservative constituency. The Falcons, formerly Livingston Estate, Battersea Village, formerly St John's Estate, were all sold off, despite a council housing list waiting list of thousands even then. Now you may, well, you, you may well say, why am I bringing up the past? But it's important to understand the political culture in which the current leader has come from, one which actively prided itself in dismantling the project of state subsidised housing. The origins of the crisis facing us and the thousands of Londoners that signed the petition, the crisis originates from the ideology and policies pioneered by this very council. It is no wonder why the councillors opposite think part right to buy and shared ownership schemes are the answer, as if that shows you're down with it, as, as, as if that shows you know what's going on. How proud you are of your 80% market rate quote-unquote affordable housing record. It's ludicrous. It's the same ideological impetus that has driven your government to announce it's going to funnel money into home ownership loans over social rent. This is literally planning to stimulate demand during a supply crisis. It's completely absurd. The record speaks for itself. Since the Conservatives took over this council, you have sold off 14,143 council homes. And in the last 15 years, how many council homes have you built? 243. 243, that's your legacy. That is what I and my friends, as someone born and raised in Battersea, have inherited. You sold my generation out. That 243 is 1.3% of all the homes built in Wandsworth in the last 15 years. 1.3%. What history shows us is that Wandsworth Tories have always used housing policy to try and reduce the number of council tenants. They have done this for decades, and now we are witnessing the repercussions. The crisis that this petition is clearly symbolic of has been started and exacerbated by the councils like Wandsworth and the policy direction they took housing in. There are no council homes being built as part of the Battersea Power Station development, unsurprisingly. And what little affordable housing was committed to, this council has let slide. In this context, our motion is therefore very simple. It is a basic first step towards giving this council a progressive housing policy. We simply ask that this council sticks to its own affordable housing requirements. It is depressing that this, that this is what we have to ask of Wandsworth Tory Council in the midst of a housing crisis. Now the second ask gets to the centre of what happened this summer and what has happened across London. The practice of developers using the secrecy and loopholes of the viability system to break their promises on affordable housing commitments. All developers should be made, at a minimum, to provide the borough's required level of affordable housing. That is currently 25% and it should be made much higher. Now, should developers fail, all viability studies used should be publicly available and not redacted. The public should be able to see for themselves what an unviable profit margin looks like. 
I understand that this policy might be scary for a council with a record like Wandsworth's, where to quote a recent report into Wandsworth past, the line between politician, official, developer and lobbyist are barely drawn. The Labour group is going to be drawing clear red lines, putting our residents before developers' profits. Thank you. So can you switch your mic off, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm also grateful for the opportunity to speak on this petition, but I think that's probably the only point that I will share with Councillor Dickerdom. Um, I feel the petition has captured the frustration of Londoners who feel priced out of the property market, and it's why we in Wandsworth have such an ambitious building programme of homes across all ten years, because we believe in increasing supply to meet the demand. Uh, we understand and champion the need that people have to own their own homes and to have a space of their own. It's one of the pillars of conservatism. It's one of the reasons that we are very proud of our right to buy pioneering schemes in the 1980s. It's one of the reasons we are proud to pioneer right to part buy and why we will continue to innovate with home poli development policies in order to help people have a home of their own and not be reliant on the state for handouts. When I read this petition, I can hear the anger that our residents and people across the capital and beyond feel about a system which they believe exists only to provide for society's wealthiest. The anger is being channeled at developers who are building high-profile schemes. It's being channeled at councils. There are those people on the other side of the chamber who are very, very pleased that they're di directing their anger in that way. But unfortunately, I'm not one of them. If we place the blame in the wrong places and continue to force tr or try to force developers down unviable routes, what we will do is we won't solve the crisis. We will make it a thousand times worse. We will never be able to help people if we don't understand what the problem is and then fix it. The changes to the delivery schedule of the affordable housing in the power station are disappointing, but they happen within a wider macroeconomic context. They certainly don't represent a betrayal, and I think using these emotive, reductive terms to consider a complex issue just stops us from seeing what the problems are. The side opposite know as well as we do, that, but they are just hoping that by pursuing this simplistic, negative campaign, people will be lulled into thinking they have an answer. I don't hear any answers from your side. All I see is a group that would do anything and say anything to win an election. So... <laughs> What happened with the power station development? <laughs> so, so what happened with the power station development? I've mentioned the macroeconomic climate has changed. I, later speakers will cover the detail of the changes to the plan. But I want to be clear that we were in a negotiation with the developers. And during that negotiation, the key for us was to maintain scheme viability so that something is delivered. There's no point forcing an issue where nothing is going to be delivered. There was quite a lot that was given from the developer's side as well as from our side. That's how negotiation and cooperation works. There is nothing to be gained by our residents if the council ignores and refuses to work with developers in a constructive manner. The private sector are needed to build the homes which London and the country need. And placing impossible demands on schemes is just going to mean that no schemes are brought forward and nothing is available to, lit, to buy, thus not solving the problem of supply and watching demand increase. Londoners do need homes. To deliver this, they need strong, competent public sectors capable and willing to work with the private sector to secure the best for their communities. The best deal is not always going to adhere to an arbitrary percentage to make a nice headline. Sometimes it will exceed it. Sometimes the best deal will deliver a benefit in another area, employment, education, health, transport. The frustration of those who feel priced out of the market is real and it must be tackled. And that's why we in Wandsworth have these numerous diverse schemes running in parallel to help people find the right kind of housing for them. It's why we keep looking for new ways to increase the supply in order to meet demand. Just to give you a taster of some of our achievements, we're the second highest net housing completions across all 10 years, 1,000 affordable in the three years prior to 15-16. We've got the fourth highest net of all 10 years in London in the pipeline. Our track record of affordable delivery, we're going to deliver over 1,500 in the next three years. Within Nine Elms, we already have Riverlight with 116, Embassy Gardens with 98 affordable, 
The residence has units with long-term tenancies offering a different type of tenure. We're also maximising our own individual delivery potential. And just to put this into context, let's, I, I'm pleased that you brought up the social housing. We delivered twice as much social rent housing as Hammersmith and Fulham in 2016. In Merton, we delivered six times as many as Merton. We delivered 143 to Lambeth minus 17 in 2016 and 143 to, their, to Kingston's minus 7. Can I so ask we've you to start winding up, Councillor? Every Labour borough that neighbours us. We're nine times as many affordable as Merton, 18% more affordable than Lambeth, 632 affordable compared to Kingston's minus 7. Three and a half times as much intermediate as Hammersmith and Fulham. And Can you come to a conclusion, to please, Councillor? Yes. Londoners do need homes. What they need is conservative councils that are capable of delivering them, not silly, silly shop tactics. <laughs> Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes. Uh, we need homes, and I too was appalled at the Battersea Power Station story of the cutting of the housing units and the knock on effect it has on all the housing in the borough, especially the private rental sector. In Roehampton, we will be focusing on the development of Pocklington Court, as I now believe most, if not all, of the residents with uh, site difficulties and other special needs have been moved out. Um, on that point, it was not Justin Greening who helped the owner of Hooch to find new accommodation in Roehampton. It was me, as she claimed. We will be calling for a good percent of social housing to be included as by shutting the home, the trust unleashed 80 plus vulnerable adult, adults into social housing in the PRS. Surely, Pocklington Trust should be held to account for this reduction of housing for vulnerable people. One of our lecturers at the university does not have enough points for social housing and therefore can only afford a bedroom in shared accommodation and when his two children come back from university he sleeps on the sofa. I would say that it is up to someone to monitor this lack of affordable housing in Wandsworth and the extortionate PRS and rent and, and the conditions and that this responsibility should be with the local government. You can't just trust the market to provide the standard of housing that we see as being affordable and decent or, as a consequence, bring down the extortionate rent charged by the PRS. Also, the process of large numbers of students moving into a residential population is referred to as student studentification. This is what we have in Roehampton. A lot of the student accommodation is in a poor state. I have had this conversation with many people who reply Yes, we remember our student accommodation. It was appalling and it was the norm. Not anymore. With students now paying around £9,000 a year, they are now referred to as consumers and customers of an expensive product. They now have cons customer rights to demand good accommodation. The landlords in Roehampton, whose accommodation is substandard, need to be held account. We need to license the PRS who house students to ensure they provide decent accommodation as well. The number of different types of substandard living in Wandsworth is mounting. The Citizens Advice Wandsworth reports of families whose only suitable place they could find within the PRS was above LHA, so they have had to make up the difference from their small incomes and benefits. Also, other families have reported that although their rent is at LHA level or below, their accommodation cannot be judged as decent. Again, I would suggest, that I would urge the Council to liaise with the Citizens Advice Wandsworth to identify these landlords and license them to ensure decent homes. The main cases I have through casework highlight overcrowding within the PRS, and yes, I have reported them all. One family was sharing with transient labourers, and another case involves a single mum with two children who have now grown up but still have to share one bedroom. What is emerging from this picture above is a council that care much more for the develop developers and the landlords than their tenants. A large part of the solution would be to bring in overall licensing that rewards good landlords from the fines accumulated from the bad landlords. Also, that the council holds developers to account by making their viability assessments public. We are listening to our residents and know we need to build more homes for the many and not just for the few. Thank you. Councillor Dunn. Thank you. 
Well, I think we can all agree that Londoners need more homes, but um, I can't agree with the uh, minority party's viewpoint on this. I mean, arguably housing is probably the most important issue of our times after Brexit, and, um, and London has a particular problem. Um, and what hasn't really been um, mentioned as much this evening is one of our huge problems is the cost of land. And, you know, this is, we cannot get away from the fact that land in London is highly expensive, and this affects everything in the equation. Now, the minority party um, would like to present the case that it's the Labour Party that are the party of social housing. Well, if I could just give us all a little history lesson, um, that has not always been the case, always the case. Um, there have been two massive building programs um, in the last century. And um, there was a post-war building program of social housing, and then there was a building program in the 1980s. And under Margaret Thatcher's government, more council housing was built each year than in the whole of the new Labour government. And if I just give you a few figures, in the years um, of new Labour, so 97 to um, 2010, less than 7,000 council houses were built. Under Margaret Thatcher, in the worst year, 17,000 council houses were built. So can I just... Can I just say that you cannot claim the minority party to be the party of social housing because we got there first. Sorry, it's a fact. The numbers are there. But, but actually, I think the real scandal in um, social housing has been the massive, um, you talk about sales of council housing, has been the massage, ma massive sale of, by Labour councils of housing to housing associations at tiny, in tiny, tiny amounts. And those transfers, typically, you would have properties transferred at um, a cost of about £5,000 a unit, wholesale from councils to housing associations. And the reason for this was quite straightforward. It's a risk-averse culture where the idea of the, the landlord cost, the responsibility for repairs and so on, was going to be transferred to a different body. But the fact is that that wholesale transfer meant that there wasn't a capital receipt, the sort of capital receipt that a Conservative council would have got. And that capital receipt, Conservative councils like Wandsworth have used to build and invest in their council stock. And Wandsworth, as a council, if you look at our housing stock as of a very high standard, we have a proud record on our home decency standard. And I, like many of my Conservative colleagues, have been into council blocks in Putney, in Battersea, in Tooting, and we have been in and out of council flats, and we know, and houses, and we know what the standards are like. We have casework, as you do, and if there are problems, we deal with them. Now, what I would also like to do is to just dispel one popular myth, which is the reason that councils haven't built council housing is it's because the government have capped borrowing. This is completely untrue. What the research has been done, and actually the main factor holding councils back, particularly Labour councils, is this risk-averse culture. They do not want to build and then have to maintain and be a landlord for many, many units. Now, the Mayor for London, who happens to be a Labour Mayor now, has been given £3.1 billion to spend on housing. He promised on his election manifesto to deliver 80,000 units a year. Well, we're more than a year in. We're 18 months in to his tenure, and he hasn't delivered any housing. I mean, I think that's very poor. It's astonishingly poor. Now, just to finish up, because I can see the orange light, we need to be grown-ups about this, because this is a terrible legacy for our children going, out, get, going forward. I recognize that I am of a generation that my husband and I have been able to buy a house. My children will not be able to buy a house in London. And I think the parties need to work together to find solutions. And just focusing on council housing isn't the solution. We need to be creative. And this is what Wandsworth Council is doing. It is looking at all forms of, a social, of social housing, affordable housing, 
shared occupancy and so on. And I urge colleagues, please, on both sides, to share that experience. Thank you. Councillor McDermott. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm, I think we're all, all agreeing tonight, of course Londoners need, need homes, and I think the first part of your petition is actually, actually right, Councillor Dickerdem. But this, it's this government and Wandsworth that are actually doing something about it. I was up at the party conference, the Conservative Party conference in Manchester last week, and housing, surprise, surprise, um, and housing was the number one topic. In fact, I think it's probably above Brexit, as far as I could see there. But it was really good to hear that Theresa May announcing, and I quote, a new generation of council houses to help fix our broken market. An extra £2 billion will be added to the total of £9 billion to allow homes to be built for social rent. And that extra £2 billion is going to in, um, lever in another £5 billion in the public and private sector to build a, over 25,000 new homes for social rent. And on top of that, and um, here we talk about not social rent, the, the other way of owning houses, is the government is supporting many more families to buy their own home. And they're investing £10 billion in help to buy. The government's had a, got a good record here. They've helped over a million people get onto the housing ladder. And the number of first-time buyers rose by 70% between 2010 and 2016. And in 2017, new home building surged the highest level since 2008. 220,000 more homes across England. And do you know what's helped? What really has helped is a stable and balanced economy. Very low, very low mortgage rates, perhaps you don't pay more a mortgage. Very low mortgage rates have a real boon to hope. If you want to own a home, you have to have a mortgage. Yes, but please. The lowest rate, very low mortgage rates have been a real boon to home ownership. The lowest rate on record in August was down at 1.35%. Can you imagine if Jeremy Corbyn was in charge of all this with his reckless spending plans? The economy would be in dire straits, mortgage rates would rock it up, and home ownership would be a nightmare. Let us and we speak. must remember that Labour doesn't have a particularly stunning re track record on house Councillor, if you wanted to speak, you should... And I'm following up a bit on what Councillor Dunn's saying. In 2000. Eight, nine, only 75,000 new homes were started, the lowest level of house building in peacetime since the 1920s. But we're certainly doing our bit in Wandsworth to residents. We've just looked at the Hidden Homes programme, over 250 hounds, homes in underused nooks and crannies on council estates, or the way shared ownership has given um, residents a leg up. One of our Ballam residents, coincidentally called Claire, was delighted to buy a 25% share in a two-bedroom apartment in um, a Paragon Housing Association, something she'd never thought of without the great help from the home, owner home ownership team. Or Matthew, a policeman in Nine Elms. He now lives in River Lake Quay and finds he's paying less with a joint mortgage and part rent than he was paying rent previously. So real people do live in Nine Elms. Now, turning to Councillor Dickerdem's petition, of course we need men as many affordable homes as possible, particularly in the Nine Elms area. And when I was chairman of planning, and I know Councillor Sweet is doing just the same, and he has referred to it, we always drove a hard bargain, not only with Bassey Power Station, but all developers across the opportunity area. We need to squeeze out every affordable flat we can from each developer. We're here for the residents of Wandsworth, not the fat cat builders. And we have done well. We've earned praise from the Mayor of London. But building more and more streets and towers of affordable housing is not the simple answer. The infrastructure has to go with them. We need roads, schools, GPs to go with those houses. And um, what if the petitioner was successful in his demand to retain the 250 affordable homes at this earlier stage? Other elements of the Battersea Power Station development would suffer. Bassey Power Station will be a desirable and vibrant place for people to live, affordable or full market, because the money, and it's not a bottomless pot, is shared across a range of needs, and I'll just list the f things we really have managed to save in, in Bassey. The iconic heritage building, the rebuilding of the famous chimneys, the excavating a major spur of the Northern Line, working with Apple to locate this international high-tech headquarters in, in 
in um, Nine Elms. Public squares, river walks, doctor surgeries, commercial units, community halls, as well as constructing many affordable homes as possible. The petition is unrealistic and the petitioner doesn't understand the process of building homes and building a place we want to live in around them. And nor does the Mayor of London. Does he want to be remembered as the Mayor, rem remembered as the mayor for Can stalling the whole up, development of Bassey Power Station? Let's reject this knee-jerk petition, get on with sensible and successful house building in Wandsworth. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Belton. Uh, Mr Mayor. Somewhat surprised at point of information about Councillor Dunn's statistics. Uh, Councillor, I hate to disillusion you. There's no such thing. A point, uh, point, point of order. First point, explanation. Point of order, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Um, my understanding is that in the course of a debate, any member at any point can seek, with your uh, uh, august permission, to make a contribution to that debate, and there is no need to put this under any other. Uh, category. This is very different from, for example, during questions when one would have to demonstrate a point of order or a point of personal explanation. But in debate, any member can be called at any point to make a contribution by your good self. You're absolutely correct. Now, had Councillor Critchard asked to speak, that would have been slightly different. If she asked please, to speak Mr. now... Please, Mr. Mayor, please but, may I but speak? But before you do, especially... <laughs> I have called Councillor Belton. Are you happy to... Councillor Critchard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Belton. Um, I think we were slightly surprised by Councillor Dunn's statistics. I'm just looking at house building trends since 1946. About 180,000 per annum in around 1948 onwards, dropping to well under 60,000, probably around 30,000 in 1987. So, and it continued to be that low. So I would suggest that Councillor Dunn has a revision of her statistics on, count, on council house building according to the groups. Um, point, point to personal explanation. I'm happy to uh, share the data with Councillor Critchard. Councillor Belton. <laughs> Mr Mayor, I am... Um... Oh. Shall I sit down while we're <laughs> carrying? <laughs> Mr, Mr Mayor, I am... Um... I found it too difficult, very difficult today to try and work out what I was going to say. But uh, I think Councillor Dickerton said almost everything I wanted to say. So I feel like throwing what I wrote away and have done and starting again from somewhere else. And I just want to point out a few things. First, first, of, all, first of all, there's actually a reasonable amount of agreement on some elements of it. On some, we all agree about viability schemes being more open, more transparent, indeed public. Um, that's something, by the way, which Sadiq Khan's been arguing for, uh, which we will argue for uh, now and have argued for, and which we will put into effect if we get the chance in a few months' time. And I think it's clearly something uh, the majority party are thinking of. So we agree about that. Secondly, we agree there's a housing crisis. Uh, it'd be somewhat difficult uh, to not acknowledge that. But that's where we start having a few problems. If you listen to Councillor Salio, and congratulations on your, uh, maybe your first, very nearly your first as, as housing cabinet member. Um, but there we are, we've built more, we've done more, and we've encouraged more, and yet we've got a falling percentage of owner occupiers, which must be the first time in history, uh, given what well, an occupy, occupation was in 1945, where it's been to subsequently, and now we've got a quite a rapidly falling uh, an occupation, which I doubt was in the Tory plans. Secondly, uh, it really, Councillor McDermott, supporting people to buy, especially by financial inducement, I think almost any economist of any standing at all will tell you the obvious about that. That merely pushes up the price. You haven't affected the supply. You've just given, improved some people's ability to compete, and the price goes up, which, of course, is very nice for the Tory voting owner occupiers who already exist because their own properties are going up in value and being pushed up in value all the time. Third, Councillor Dunn, you really do need to get your figures right. I'm not sure about all the details, but let's take the ones I know very well indeed. 
when I was involved in this, and Councillor Heaster and Councillor Johnson might be courageous enough to admit it, in the 1970s, a Labour council was building very nearly a thousand council homes a year. We tried to get to a thousand, we got to about eight, nine hundred. We never quite made it. Councillor Salia for water, whatever she's saying about six times the amount in this borough, or seven times that amount in another borough, that means 35 as opposed to six. That's the kind of equivalent. And we were building these very large amounts. It increased 30,000 properties in the borough, I would say. I mean, the number of hereditaments, which will do for uh, places that you can own, was, and I know this from uh, Mr. Buss, who was in charge of council tax and could tell you how many council taxes were collected, was about 92, 3,000 in the early 90s. It's now well over 120,000, maybe 125,000. So we pushed up the number of places you can live in by 30,000, which I suspect is a higher rate of increase than the actual population rate of increase. But yet we've got a housing crisis. Isn't there something wrong with your analysis here? Um, what I think is absolutely critically wrong is that there's not enough, as Councillor Dickerton said, at the very lowest end. We're always so fussed, or re rather your party's always so fussed, about the owner occupiers and about the young uh, you know, the people here, I can give the name. I mean, Councillor Hogg, for instance, my own leader, fussing about how it's difficult it is to... But actually, we're all talking, everyone in this room is talking from a relatively affluent position. And we know that from our casework. And their options are zero. And that's really annoying and really infuriating. They're zero. And everyone recognizes that, including the majority. People who recognize it include the CPI. And even brilliant Mrs. May last week said we need more. I could go on about that in all sorts of ways. I clearly won't. But I just want to add one other concern where I disagree slightly with my own colleagues. And that is, I think, one of the big worries is I doubt whether... Ba I'm not at all sure that Battersea Power Station Development Group can hack it. Uh, they may not be able to hack it. And it is precisely because the impossible demands being put on developers, as Councillor Salier quite correctly said, but where do the impossible demands come from? They come actually from central government, which is saying we're no longer going to invest in underground, we're no longer going to invest in roads, we're not going to help you build schools, we're not going to help you hos build hospitals. You must do it all through the planning system. And we're making this smallish system, planning system, do everything that we want to achieve. And that's got to be impossible. And that development is something that's come out of the Tory government and to a certain extent the Labour government before. But it's a recent development and we should get back out of it and get planning back to what it's meant to be doing and not forcing everything else to come out of the private sector and not the public sector. The public sector should pay more, which means more taxation, and we have to do something about that. A change our attitudes to taxation, which are set by Thatcher and a bit Blair, I confess, and we need to get back to a, a larger public sector and not a smaller one. Councillor uh, Sweet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think, as many people have said, there is some agreement between us. We, we do need more homes in London. But the difference is that, that we, uh, on this side, are... Um, offering solutions. We're actually building homes across all ten years that people can live in. And I think we all know that many people did sign the petition. Um, we, as I said, do need more homes in Wandsworth. But let's just zoom in on the petition a little bit. Only 60 of the people that signed that petition out of 21,000 actually live in the immediate area around Battersea Power Station. And I think it's worthwhile asking why is that? Because surely the reason is that, surely it is, the reason is that people in Queenstown Ward want this scheme to go ahead. People feel strongly about housing. And one reason I know that is because of the amount of praise that we've had in Wandsworth for our housing policies. And one resident said last month at a Let's Talk meeting that 
the Winstanley York Road home building was one of the best estate regeneration deals anywhere in the country. Well, I'd like to thank Councillor. I'd like to thank Councillor Hogg for saying that. Actually, you know, he did say that it was one of the best estate regeneration deals anywhere in the country. Councillor, um, I point this out because it's evidence that Battersea Power Station was not a typical scheme for this council. I've already said this evening that we are achieving 27% on schemes in Nine Elms. We didn't achieve the maximum amount that we achieved elsewhere in, in, in the opportunity area on the power station because it's a special site. We do make sure developers build affordable homes where they can. We squeeze them for all they're worth. But if you squeeze too hard, they burst. And if Labour had its way, then Battersea Power Station would too. Last night, I was at Battersea Power Station and I had the privilege of hearing Councillor Anderson ask a, a very good question. And she asked the CEO of Battersea Power Station what options he had other than to reduce affordable housing given the £750 million increase in costs he'd had. And his answer was one word. He said, stop. Stopping was the only option he had. Something had to give, or he would have gone the same way as the previous two owners of the sites and go bankrupt. And it was the only option that we had too, because if you undermine the economic viability of the power station, then you stop it happening. You stop the new tube, you stop the restoration of the most famous building in Wandsworth. You stop 4,500 new homes being built. You stop 20,000 new jobs coming to Battersea. I'd like to ask what would Labour say to the 69 apprentices from the local area currently working on site? Because I don't think they signed the petition. I don't think the Mayor of London would be very happy either. After all, he's already included the 386 new affordable homes being produced by Peabody on the Battersea Power Station site, he's already included those in his affordable housing figures. <laughs> and let's go a bit further. He's also said that Apple's decision to move to the power station is a sign that London is open and that it's the, the leading city for trade and investment. So let's make no mistake, Battersea Power Station is the linchpin of Nine Elms. The rest of the regeneration can't happen if we allow it to stop. I'd like to ask, why wasn't Councillor Dickadem there last night as well? He could have heard Battersea Power Station explain themselves to our community and to our charities that were there. He talks about transparency, but if you really wanted to know what was going on, maybe you would have gone along to an event at Battersea Power Station and asked them face to face to explain themselves as they did last night. I think that Labour know full well that Battersea Power Station is a commercial transaction. It's not a promise. The development needs to break even or we get nothing. How else can we expect them to pay for all the benefits that we're demanding for the community? The only promises that we should be talking about this evening are our own ones, and that is to deliver 18,000 new homes in Wandsworth in the next 10 years. Wandsworth does build affordable homes at scale, and Labour know that we do. Battersea Power Station isn't an empty shell anymore. And we should celebrate that the lights are on there and five people are moving in every single day at the moment into the new homes on the site. So let's reject this motion, support our amendment and start talking about the benefits that this is bringing to Wandsworth residents. I'd like to, I'd like to, offer, some, I'd like to offer some information. My best friend is a apprentice dry liner on the Nine Elms site. He signed the petition. He also lives with his mum like me because he can't afford to move out. Councillor White. Whoops. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and, and uh, welcome in your first evening as, uh, as Mayor. We are indebted to 38 degrees for the petition uh, of over 21,000 signatures and indeed for reminding the me members opposite that Londoners need homes. As many of those 21,000 signatories are the left behind by the crazy housing policies of this council and its government and the outrageous council deals that contribute to this crisis. Theresa May decides to cough up two billion pounds for social housing, which even if it is new money, brings us only back to where we were in 2010. And according to Councillor Dunn and Councillor McDermott, that wasn't enough. 
and forgets the £10 billion affordable housing grant since 2010 that's been cut. And of course, it's only one-fifth of the money promised to inflate house prices. The money will not be enough to make a serious dent in the housing crisis in Wandsworth when this con council continues to allow developers to fall short of the London Mayor's targets and succumbs to erroneous viability criteria to fail to deliver 35% affordability on private land and 50% on public. Time after time, this council allows developers to renege, even on a reduced office offer. 15% in the case of Batsy Power Station and seemingly everywhere else roughly 20%. Affeldean, Springfield and Swandon Way spring to mind. Even the Winstanley development is 35%, still short of the 50% required on public land, despite the hard work of the Latchmere councillors who raised it to that level. What happened to the animal entrepreneurial spirit? Entrepreneurial risk is stripped out of these in, uh, agreements and developers' profits are ring-fenced. Who suffers? As in all cases, the ordinary pre people. Deprived of uh, affordable housing, we end up with houses few can afford and housing we don't need. Only 8% of Londoners can afford 80% of its housing. Just like bankers before them, developers' profits are copper-bottomed and the public pay for the losses. Why are we faced with infrastructure versus affordable homes choices in all of these cases? Why can't we have both? If the infrastructure is absolutely necessary, and most of it is, then why isn't the developers' profit levels examined before this council caves in? In the Battersea Power Station example, the developer can take roughly £1 billion profit at its own viability estimates and deliver 35% affordability, 1,375 homes rather than the 386. Why didn't this council insist on that in the first place and insist on that number now? In Nine Elms, another 1,000 plus could have been delivered. Viability assessments based on projected land values and ignoring the low cost of debt mean that even the one billion, billion pound profit is an underestimation. And this isn't enough, apparently. Why, in the case of the Affeldean and Springfield, is there a choice between NHS infrastructure provision and affordability? Why isn't there a proper developer and council partnership deal in place that balances risk between the parties? And failing that, why isn't the majority party's government not providing the funds for much-needed NHS facilities or the affordable housing on these sites? Government grant was available to build the Floria Academy School in Earlsfield. Ideological need was answered in that example. Yet a health centre and mental health facilities which will mean 30% of affordability will be lost. But the 20% profit margin will be retained. Less than a year ago, I told you the minority party would win the council next year. You laugh then, and that has been the issue with the majority group for far too long. You're just not serious enough. You thought you were unassailable. You thought sweetheart deals with your favourite developers would go on forever. But I'll give you another forecast tonight. When the minority group take control next year, those deals will be gone. Real partnerships will be sought, such that when a developer agrees to deliver a certain amount of affordable housing, then that's what will be delivered. When we agree viability criteria, we will publish it, and it will be based on the current land value and on the actual cost to the developer. And when your Prime Minister splatters, there will be a rebirth of council house building. We won't ask the Chancellor for a cough suite. We'll expect enough money to do precisely that. The matter now before the Councillors, the amendment moved by Councillor Sully and seconded by Councillor Sweet on the London State Home Petition. Please indicate by a show of hands those for the amendment. Those against the amendment. Any 
Are there any abstentions? The amendment is carried 29-18. The matter now before the Council is the motion as amended, as amended, moved by Councillor Dickadem and seconded by Councillor White. Please indicate by a show of hands those for the motion as amended. In fact, is that unanimous? Is that unanimous? That's unanimous. That's unanimous. Thank you very much.